All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the San Anselmo Library's Virtual Art Talk Tuesday, Dorothea Lang, That Such Things Could Be. This is our first Virtual Art Talk Tuesday of 2021. I'm so excited to be here with everybody <laughs> and doing this again. Um, and just let's be positive for this new year that we're entering right now. Um, I'm Sarah Yon. I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Library. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library and the Library Parcel Tax for sponsoring this program and all library programs. So everyone will remain muted until the end of the presentation. If you have a question for Avril, please type it into the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat and will alert Avril to any questions received there. And a special thank you for your patience and understanding during this program. I'm, I'm still learning everything we can and can't do with Zoom. So uh, thank you for your patience and understanding on that. Um, we are recording this program today and I will send the link to everyone who mm -hmm. registered. So if you miss anything, you can go back and rewatch it later. Our speaker today is Avril Angevine. Avril is an independent art lecturer and she teaches um, English and Humanities at local colleges. She's also a museum guide at the SF MoMA and Oakland Museum. Her particular interests are modern art and California art and design. Her website, talkingaboutart.net, has short videos about people and movement in California art. I will include the link to her website in the chat box so you guys can look at it after the presentation. There's a lot of really great videos in there. So please join me in welcoming April Angela Angeline back to our virtual art talk Tuesday. <laughs> I'm cheering for everybody here. <laughs> Thank you, Sariana. Um, really good to be here in the virtual world. Uh, not as nice as actually being at the San Anselmo Library, which is a really lovely little space, but um, happy to be here. And so let me see. I'll pull up my screen here and here we go. I'll do there. And to kind of get started, slideshow from the beginning. Yes, from the beginning. Okay, so uh, we are going to be talking a little bit <laughs> of politics today, not the politics of our time. We've all had enough of that. It's nice to take a break, at least for an hour, but politics of almost 100 years ago, a time when art and politics were very much intertwined and politics was an important subject for art particularly in photography, which is what we're going to be looking at uh, today. So even if you are someone who doesn't know a lot about photography, say you don't know an F stop from an F sharp <coughs> or an F flat, I'm sure you know the work of two important American photographers, Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams. Now, both of them are not just from California, but from the Bay Area. <clears throat> they knew one another, they worked together frequently, uh, although their goals for photography <clears throat> were often quite different. Um, Ansel Adams and um, Edward Weston worked together in 1932 to plan an exhibition that announced the arrival of Group F64 and what they called straight photography, that is photography that celebrated what the camera could do, something like this, work by Weston. Um, sharpness, deep focus, black and white, and stop trying to look like an impressionist painting. So at this time, in the early 30s, Lang had known Weston and Ansel Adams since the 20s, and they considered her for inclusion in the important first F64 exhibition that was held at the De Young Museum. But at that time, she was a studio portrait photographer, and they considered that her work was not pure enough photography. Well, <clears throat> quite soon, Lang became a master of clear-eyed, sharp images that shone a light on the dark corners of the American experience in the Depression, in the war years, and in the complicated post-war world. And she asked, and she asked us to ask, how such things could be. So let's see how she did it. Here we go. Dorothea Nutshorn was born in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1895. Now she contracted polio when she was seven. And although she recovered her mobility, she had a limp for the rest of her life, which makes the energy and stamina that she brought to her documentary work in the 30s sort of 
close to miraculous. Um, her father separated, left the family when she was 12, at which time uh, Lang moved with her mother and her brother to New York City. Here's an early photograph of her mother. And uh, Dorothea took her mother's name, Lang, which probably was a wise career move. She became Dorothea Lang. Uh, as a young girl, she spent many hours wandering the streets of the Lower East Side and would later say that this was where she learned to see. These years also taught her that the poor possessed dignity and humanity and that if she put on what she called her cloak of invisibility, this is a term that she used many times later in life, she could see without disrupting people or being herself unsafe. But as a teenager, she expanded her walks to include sort of the posher parts of New York, upscale mansions, galleries of modern art, and she may well have been to Alfred Steiglitz's gallery at 291 Fifth Avenue opened in 1905. That's it down at the bottom, underneath the headquarters to save New York. So it's a good idea to save New York. Thank God they did. Um, <clears throat> this was before the Armory Show in 1913. Steiglitz's gallery was the place to see modern art in America, including contemporary trends in photography. Now Steiglitz himself and his protege Edward Steichen were proponents of what's called pictorialism. This is a style in which photographers aim to prove once and for all that photography could produce art. So this is the kind of Steiglitz picture. Um, <clears throat> they were concerned to create beautiful, moody, crafted compositions made by using a range of darkroom techniques. There's another famous and gorgeous image. Now, pictorialism was not a long-lived school, but it was the style at the turn of the century when Lang, after graduating from high school in 1912, announced that she wanted to be a photographer despite not having had or even having held a camera at that point. But her first job was in the studio of Arnold Genth, someone who was one of the most famous early photographers of San Francisco, who moved and opened a studio uh, in 1911 in the greener photographic pastures, I guess, of New York. Um, now, Genth is an interesting man himself. Eh, look at a couple of his images. He's known for having shot the only remaining photographs of San Francisco's Chinatown before the earthquake. There's one of them there. And although that picture does not have the pictorial blur sort of that uh, the Steichen and Steiglitz do, he's considered a pictorialist because his idea of creating a mood in these works was to crop out or dodge out anything that looked like Western culture. But on the right in his um, a portrait of Greta Garbo, you can see that he's a master of the soft lens, the sort of pic pictorialist style. Now Lang learned a lot from Genth including something that became a trademark of hers, which was to click the shutter when the sitter didn't expect it. And he gave her her first camera, which is kind of nice. So Lang quickly developed wanderlust, and so she and a school friend saved up uh, money for a trip around the world. And as the famous story goes, she made it to San Francisco before she lost her money. I think it was stolen, actually. Um, and this is where her life as a professional photographer started. She got a job uh, at a photo shop where she became fascinated with snapshots, which um, she realized, in which she realized that photographs could tell a social as well as a personal story. She met the artist Roy Partridge in the shop. He was a printmaker who taught at Mills College um, and became friends with him and his wife, Imogen Cunningham, uh, with whom she had a lifelong friendship. Here's a couple of images of, oh dear, Imogen Cunningham, of Roy Partridge by Imogen Cunningham. And here you can see the difference. The one on the left is from around 1905. And that's a nice, soft, pictorialist image on the Dipsy Trail in Marin County. The other one on the right, oh my goodness, you have to look at that for a while to even realize what it is. This is an F64 photograph that is not really about a person. It's about light and dark 
and angles. It's kind of wonderful. He um, stayed quite fit between these years. And right? um, it's good. So meanwhile, Lang sets up a photography studio on Sutter Street, right near Union Square, that was successful beyond her wildest dreams. She managed to serve the same wealthy clientele that Genth had done when he was there. And her style, kind of modern, artistic, intimate, that is to say, kind of pictorialist, um, appealed to the wealthy people of San Francisco. And I thought you'd like to see these two young men. Oops, not him. These are the Haas brothers. I think that must be Walter in the front. He's older. It's a wonderful picture. Um, so at age 26, Lang is the top portrait photographer in the city. And she soon met the most dramatic artist in the city, Maynard Dixon, and they soon married. Now they were a magic couple, but they were not immune to the effects of the depression as the 30s began, both financial effects and we could say moral effects of the depression. So in the spring of 1932, uh, Lang turns from the walls of her studio where she's got photographs of her clients, the Fleischackers, the De Youngs, and so forth, the Haases, and she looks out the window down at a crowd of unemployed men outside the building, and as she said, she understood the depression for the first time. And as she said, the discrepancy between what I was working on and what was going on in the streets was more than I could assimilate. I thought I would go down and see if I could grab a hunk of lightning. So accompanied by her um, out of work brother, she headed out into the streets with her giant Graflex camera and tripod and she took this picture, the white angel bread line, which is absolutely extraordinary and people friends of hers people who came to her studio didn't understand what was going on with her but this i think um an early image but a really important one that shows us a lot of what dorothea lang is about so this is both a powerful narrative picture in other words the subject is important and the style is important too. It's beautifully constructed and a little bit unusual for her because she's shooting from a higher perspective, looking down, which is not, she must've been on some stairs, not what she usually does. But the use of the fence, the angle of the fence and the uh, arms and uh, hands clasped of the man there in the middle, everybody else looking the other way and him looking towards us, looking down the hats and everything. This really um it almost looks like the man is praying this has kind of everything that we expect in a dorothea lang image it's quite wonderful so by 1934 <clears throat> dorothea had her first show of these new works at the oakland studio at 683 brockhurst which was where the f64 group weston ansel adams imogen cunningham got started and at her exhibition, uh, it was attended by a man named Paul Taylor, who was an agricultural economist at UC Berkeley. Now, in addition to being an academic, he was a very politically engaged man, and he recognized that photography could really enrich his kind of dry economic reports. Um, and he quickly realized the power of Lang's photography. So he invited a group of photographers, including Imogen Cunningham and Dorothy Lang, to accompany him on a trip to document a self-help uh, community set up by the unemployed up in Oroville. And this is when Taylor actually met Lang for the first time. He was impressed by the first picture she took getting out of the car. Oh, I'm sorry, there's two more images of the San Francisco, this one in Oroville. And she was impressed by the way Taylor talked to the workers he was, whose lives he was documenting so that they revealed so much about themselves and their plight and their situation. And this became standard practice for Lang too. And her photographs were often accompanied by long captions either about her subjects or sometimes by her subjects. So 
here they are, Dorothea Lang and Paul Taylor in a photograph by Imogen Cunningham from about 1936. So they formed a lifelong partnership um, that involved two divorces. <clears throat> so Lang divorced Maynard Dixon, Taylor divorced his wife, they got married and worked together uh, forever. But between 1935 and 1939, they formed this incredible partnership, he writing and she photographing, bringing attention to the plight of the nation's poor and forgotten people, sharecroppers, displaced families, and migrant workers. Now, these photographs were commissioned by various New Deal agencies um, aiming to generate sympathy for the dispossessed and support for what the government was doing, and they were distributed free to newspapers. So let's look at some of these works. They worked in the South. She's very good with signs. She often gets a sign in there. And <clears throat> notice always how her photographs tell a story, but how they are also successfully structured. So the line of the road going back and the horizontal of the billboard it works really well. What else do we have here? Yep, there's another one. And she worked in Washington State on the apple ranches there. That's quite a famous photograph called the disturbed child, the damaged child, I think, you know. And of course, in California. So uh, 22 of her photographs that she took as part of the Farm Security Administration project were included in John Steinbeck's The Harvest Gypsies here that you see when it was originally published as seven articles in the San Francisco News in 1936. This was later published as a pamphlet called Their Blood is Strong, which sold 10,000 copies at 25 cents each. So here are some of her California pictures and lettuce workers, Filipino lettuce workers in Salinas. I'm not getting tech support here from my little thing. Yeah, there we go. One thing you'll notice is how many children are in these images. So she, like Steinbeck in his article, stressed that these were families um, involved. Yeah, there we go. And um, although when we think of um, the 30s and think of the movement West and the Okies, we generally think of white people, but Dorothea Lang shot all kinds of people, um, Mexican laborers, blacks, all sorts in her work. Uh, okay, now, yeah, there's some more by the train. She's very good with young people, lots of pictures of children. Now on a winter's day, uh, yeah, here we are, a couple more. And again, the structure of this image on the left, I think, is really powerful. And she uses the diagonal of the window of the train and his body going on the other, uh, in the other direction. Really great pictures. Now, on a winter's day in 1936, Lang was driving home from Southern California when she turned off at what was called a pea pickers camp near Nipomo, near Santa Maria in Central California. A frost had killed the crop and the people were desperate. Lang was drawn like a magnet, she said, to one group, a woman with several children. She kept moving closer and in 10 minutes, she shot six images the seventh has become the best known documentary photograph of the 20th century, a symbol of resilience in the face of adversity. And I think if you look at the right side of this, you can see which one it is, it's migrant mother. So if we look at 
the sequence all together, not all of it, we're going to look at some of it, we can see Lang's method and her uncanny skill. So this is uh, the family as she approaches them. This is sort of like an establishing shot, right? So we can see what's going on. We can see where they are and so forth. Uh, but you'll notice there's a teenage daughter there on the left. Okay, this is probably not helping the situation here. Uh, these were designed, as I said, to elicit sympathy for people, uh, to make them seem just like everyone else in their hard times. And it may have struck her that this family was too complicated, that the teenage daughter was muddying up the image in some way. So she goes closer, she moves in. And now we've got a focus on the mother and the baby, and this is like a Madonna image. But then she probably thought this might be a little too much breast for a family newspaper, might not create the image that we want. So she's got something else going on. So let's look back and look here at that trunk that's in front of them, half open. Okay, so then we go here. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, God, I hate this technology. No. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way. All right, here we are, old fashioned. Um, so we're here, we're here. And now she moves the trunk in and puts the dish on top of it, which reminds us that these are not snapshots necessarily, right? And this has got a nice diagonal. The trunk is making a diagonal pointing into the picture. We've got one child in there and the baby. They're right in the center. You know, um, it seems to be doing everything the photograph needs to do, but Lang is not done. Um, she asks the woman to bring her hand up to her face which uh, to draw attention to it, which is a device that Lang uses frequently. Often you'll see people with their hands at their face in her images. And these two are interesting because as is typical with her, they're shot a little bit from below so that the character is sort of monumentalized, right? So she gets the hand up and we get the money shot, right? So this is the one that everybody really knows. Um, and I think it's powerful because she has understood that it's the woman's face that's the most important here. I think it's probably a great idea somehow that the kids are turned back, that their faces are not um, competing with their mothers. And we still have the baby down below and the hand is drawing attention there. It's just a, a beautiful shot. And it's interesting that down below, I don't think you can see it in here, um, this piece of wood whatever it is that's in the front there, um, the woman had her finger on it, her thumb, in order to support the baby. And uh, Lang had it um, dodged down <laughs> when the picture was printed. But this is, this is the shot. Now, this is a shot that is typical and atypical for Dorothea Lang, kind of like the White Angel bread line. Um, she was known for interacting with the families and her subjects, for talking to them and even letting children touch and play with her camera. But in this case, this was done very quickly, kind of in 10 minutes. Um, so she had less interaction with them than was typical. And in her notes about the picture, she said that they had told her that they had sold the tires on the car for food. Um, she had, uh, Florence Thompson here, had six children at the time and two of the older ones later said that no, that wasn't actually the case. Um, what is known is that the subject here, whose name is Florence Thompson, was a full-blood Cherokee from Oklahoma who um, had six children at this time. She eventually had 10. And after her husband died and left her with six children, she picked cotton. At this point, she was remarried and they had come to California and were on their way to a better camp up north, I think, to pick lettuce when the car broke down and they got stuck in Napomo as they were. Now, in 1979, um, Florence Thompson contacted the Modesto Bee and identified herself as the iconic migrant mother. She was angry that she had never received a cent from this image that has been uh, depicted on stamps, on posters used all over the place. Even the Library of Congress uh, sells prints of it. 
and she never received a penny. But on the other hand, nor did Dorothea Lang. These are uh, done for the government, and she was paid a salary, and, and that's it. And there she is. So Lang and Taylor uh, published their work in a book of text and photographs on the Dust Bowl called American Exodus in 1939. So I wonder, um, Sariana, if there are any questions at this point or comments by anybody? In a second. I guess not. Okay, we'll go on. So by 1941, by 1940s, things are changing. In 1941, Lang was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for achievement in photography. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, she gave up the award to record the forced evacuation of Japanese Americans from the West Coast uh, on assignment for the War Relocation Authority. Um, they wanted to show, once again, that the evacuation process was humane, but somehow they didn't understand who Dorothea Lang was or what her work was like. Um, she traveled throughout California to photograph families being rounded up for April, evacuation. Yes. There's a question in the chat box. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, uh, Karen asked, did she receive any compensation after the book was pu published? She's talking about the woman in the portrait. Did the woman in the portrait receive any compensation after uh, the no, book was published? No, no, she didn't. I think um, they didn't have GoFundMe then, but I think uh, exposing herself like that, she she received a lot of attention, and I think she did get some money out of it. But no, she she was not, um, and she wasn't identified until that late date either. No, she didn't get any money from any of the images, which is. Um, you know, it's an interesting question in photography, an image like that, that's um, so popular and so widely distributed. And no, she didn't get anything from it. So here we are in the 40s and Lang is really interested in the West Coast uh, internment of the Japanese. And this photograph um, is on Oak Street in Oakland, where the Oakland Museum is now, which was only built in the 60s, the same place. Um, <clears throat> she uh, traveled throughout California photographing families being rounded up to leave. She visited a lot of temporary assembly centers like Tanferan uh, Racetrack. And eventually she did a series at Manzanar, which was the first of the permanent internment camps. And many of these pictures focus on waiting, um, uncertainty involved in this removal. Nice picture. This is also one of her most powerful and probably most famous works, um, something done in Oakland. And the owner of this store was a graduate of UC Berkeley. And he was not the only graduate of UC Berkeley to be rounded up and sent to an internment camp. Hey, Phil, there's another question in the chat. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Um, uh, what is the name of the migrant mother and does genealogy exist that prove 100% Cherokee? Her name was Florence Thompson and I, I don't know. I mean, that's how she's described. And of course it's ironic because it's supposed to be a picture of white Okies coming to California and she's actually Native uh, American indigenous. And I don't know if she's 100%. That's the way she's described. But um, yes, nowadays you could prove it definitively and I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so this one. <clears throat> okay, let me see what else I have here. Oh, these are really cool. So she's very, very good with children. I love um, the one on the left is at a school in San Francisco. <coughs> and I think the one on the right is probably at one of the internment camps, but just a boy, you know. Um, now, she gets to Manzanar. This is how she portrays Manzanar camp with the mountains so powerful behind it. It is unusual for Lang or possibly for any photographer to take a direct on picture like this, but in this case, um, with the rows of houses going back kind of mirroring the mountains, it's uh, really, really powerful. And with that flag there, um, look at some of her other 
Manzanar images, this ugly one, man and his grandson, probably. They were instructed not to include barbed wire in the images, but nevertheless, it's a very, very strong image. And I have another one. Yeah, like this. So you really get a sense of uh, what was going on there at the time. Now, this image, um, not in the camps, but part of the uh, roundup process that she documented, uh, is really interesting and it shows something else uh, about Dorothea Lange's work. She was really good at cropping, at finding the right image. As we saw in her series on the migrant mother, she knew what to do where the image was. So in this picture that's taken at a school, Raphael Wells Wild School in San Francisco, um, this is a nice image that shows all kinds of kids. The ones in the front are Asian and there's a black girl in the back, there are white kids, probably Filipinos, and so forth, a whole range of children. And the effect of having them all together, of course, is powerful, but we can also do something else. We can tell a different story with the image. So it's also been shown cropped down to two, which makes it much more intimate in some ways. We still have the effect of the other children in the background. Now, if you look at these two young girls, though, um, what kind of expression is on the face of each of them? In other words, do you think one of them is worried about anything? It's too complicated. I think it's the one on the left that's worried. The one on the right is sort of smiling. Oh, and we can tell, what are they doing? They're reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, of course, with their hand on their heart, if you please to do that. So I think that the girl on the left is worried, the one on the right is thinking about something else, right? And so Lang does this. And of course, this is a sharper print. That's not her fault. Um, but this is the shot that tells the story she wants to tell, honing in on the girl who has a more uh, worried expression and somehow um, narrowing it down to her alone rather than with the two puts kind of more emphasis on the kids that are in the back in some way. They become, they come closer and it, it gets the same thing done at the same time as we're focusing on just um, one girl. Now her images uh, of this whole process were so obviously critical that the army impounded most of them and they were not seen publicly for more than 50 years. But today her photos of the internment are available at uh, the National Archives and at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. So meanwhile, Lang's old friend, Ansel Adams, looked at the 30s through a very different lens. Most of the <clears throat> F-64 photographers turned to uh, more social documentary work uh, during the Depression, as Lang did. Uh, for example, this is from later, but this is Imogen Cunningham. But Ansel Adams and Edward Weston continued to photograph rocks and trees, a rather unpopular pursuit really in that desperate decade. Adams wrote that humanity needs the purely aesthetic just as much as it needs the purely material. And I think that's true. Nevertheless, Rondell Partridge, who was Imogen Cunningham's son and who worked with both Lang and Adams, um, said, Ansel once complained to me, and he said it to Dorothea too, that he didn't understand why she took all these pictures of dirty, sad things when there is so much beauty. Ansel himself never photographed a fence, a street, drunk people, or junk, so he couldn't understand. He was an art photographer and she was a people's photographer. It's kind of interesting. But by the time the war broke out, <clears throat> Adams did emerge somewhat from his cocoon of beauty, although beauty is always a concern for him. And as Lang did, um, <clears throat> Adams photographed the Japanese internment camps, which he was personally adamantly against. And as I said, both of them were told to avoid shooting barbed wire and things like that 
but Adam's Manzanar photos, which were taken a little bit later than Lang's, seem to stress humanity rather than its lack. He wanted to show how the internees had built themselves a vital community in an arid but magnificent environment. So that's his shot of Manzanar, which is a total Ansel Adams shot, where the mountains, which provide a formidable barrier, they're obviously uh, enclosed in it, but they're also this magnificent kind of inspiration. <clears throat> okay, let's look at a couple more of his images. All right, it's a nice one. So stressing the internees making a life for themselves, painting, they're creating something here, his entrance. This one, rather incredible, she's still a majorette, drum major, I guess, uh, in the camps. And he published um, <clears throat> a book on the subject called Born Free and Equal, as we can see here. Um, it was a kind of a controversial book, photo and textbook about Manzanar that accompanied an exhibit of his photos at MoMA New York. But this is interesting because still there's a human subject, but he's on the back cover. He's not on the front cover. Meanwhile, in 1942 and 43, Lang and Adams both worked on examining <clears throat> a somewhat more optimistic aspect of wartime life, and that was the Kaiser shipyard in Richmond. They worked for the War Relocation Agency, and then in 1944 and 45, they came back for Fortune magazine and did a feature on it. Now, the population of Richmond before the war was 20,000. After the war broke out, the Kaiser Shipyard employed over 10,000, 100,000 workers uh, building freighters, ships, and so forth. So a huge increase in population. And Lang was fascinated by the ethnic and racial mix of people in the shipyards, which she found uh, exhilarating and a harbinger, perhaps, of the future. Uh, that's a great shot. You must be getting off work. So we have an image like this one, which <clears throat> I believe must be a welding helmet. And somehow, simply a woman sitting in the sun, kind of taking a break, looking up like this has uh, incredible power. Again, the strength of the image, the diagonals, the way that it's constructed, and also the sense of potential and possibility that's in this simple image. It's rather um, astonishing. Let's see if I have another picture of hers there. Yeah, and this is fun, Richmond. <laughs> now, <clears throat> their methods of working Langs and Adams were different, so different as to be comic. Lang, Lang always wore her cloak of invisibility, as she called it, wandering around photographing. But Ansel Adams, however, wears a 10 gallon hat and he's got this bushy beard. He attracts attention as he sets up his bulky photography equipment. And according to a woman who worked as an assistant with both of them, she said, Dorothea treats Ansel like a baby brother, telling him what to do. He has great respect for her work, although he makes horrible comments about it. So that's a sibling relationship. But you can see Lang's influence uh, on Adams, though. Okay, and this is um, Lang's work, which is wonderful. Once again, she's using a sign in a really interesting way. But this is Adams uh, called Trailer Park Children from 1944, I think. So you can see that she had some influence on him. <clears throat> okay. So in 1945, Lang was invited by Adams to accept a position at the new Fine Art Photography Department at the California School of Fine Arts, which is today known as SFAI, the Art Institute. Uh, Imogen Cunningham and Minor White also joined the faculty at that time as well. And Lang continued uh, to work as a photojournalist uh, in the 50s. She and Perkle Jones were commissioned by Life magazine to shoot a photographic documentary of the death of Monticello, California, and of the displacement of its residents in order to form Lake Berryessa, which is a man-made lake. Okay, so these are some of her images. So unusual for Dorothea Lang to be just shooting landscape, but gorgeous. There's another one that really tells a story. 
And that's what it looked like. Oh, I like this one. And of course, we end with this. Now, uh, the magazine Life did not run this piece, but the photo collection was shown at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1960. She did other series at the time, one of which had to do with a public defender named Martin Pulich uh, working in Oakland. Um, now, somebody who works as a public defender who foregoes possibly a lucrative career as a private lawyer in order to defend the poor and people who are on the outs, this obviously resonated with Lang. Um, let's see some of this is kind of a very good image of his. You know, hard times. She often commented on how there were women, there were mothers, there were wives, girlfriends waiting and in the gallery. Right, there's one of them. I have another one here. <laughs> These are some interesting images she took of San Francisco, mother and son. I just, I love it. Uh, a couple of others, like cable cars. It's a really unusual and kind of radical photograph, right? Looking down. I wonder if she's, you know. She did other assignments for life, including one on Mormon villages, called Three Mormon Villages. There's a book of those photographs in Utah. And she traveled all over the world with her husband, Paul Taylor, who was a consultant for the State Department at that time. Here's an image she did in Korea of a little child. Now, in the last decade of her life, Lang's health was poor and she stayed rather close to home and created a wonderful series of family photographs, which we can see in a couple of images here. Once again, her unerring eye for cropping down. So the one on the left is from a much larger photograph, but the way she um, I printed it was this way. I think I have another one there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is actually from much earlier, but it's a, it's got an interesting story to it that she was such a committed photographer that when her little boy brought her a bu bouquet of daisies for Mother's Day, she shot a picture, right? That's <laughs> who she was. Now, Lang, here we go. There she is later in life. Lang died in 1965. She was 70. Three months later, the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, mounted a retrospective show of her work, which Lang herself had helped to curate in the very last, in the last months of her life. The following year, her unique collection became a gift to the Oakland Museum of California from her husband, Paul Taylor. This collection includes Lang's personal negative file of more than 25,000 images. And there are 6,000 vintage prints, which means prints made by her or at, uh, under her control at the time. And a selection from her personal papers and library, a couple of her cameras as well. Now, just this year, um, the museum has opened the Dorothea Lang Digital Archive, making the collection much more available for you to see. I think they scanned around 20,000 images that you can access online. In 2006, an elementary school was named in her honor in Napomo, California, near the site where she photographed Migrant Mother. So that's a school name we can keep, I think. And in 2018, she was immortalized on a mural in her hometown of Hoboken, New Jersey, with uh, two other women there who were also uh, people who pushed the boundaries uh, of what women can do. And there she is, that's a famous image of her right in the center. So um, she is an extraordinary photographer who, as I said, managed to combine the unequaled narrative capacity of photographs with a really beautiful style, construction, and solid imagery, creating really, really wonderful images that people are still interested in, I think, in our times, uh, 
much as any, we are interested in photographs that document the life uh, around us. So if you have any, I'm a little short in time, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them or any comments. Hi, everybody. And uh, yes, please, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I will help Avril have, oh, uh, Rodney has a question. As a woman, did she face discrimination or misogyny? Um, I, <laughs> I imagine she did, yeah. I mean, she was, uh, I, yeah, I don't know particularly, but I imagine she must have done. She was um, highly regarded by the photographers she worked with, um, but I don't know as working for government agencies if she actually experienced much discrimination. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but she managed to persevere anyway. She kept at it. Okay, Patty says, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so we, again, everybody, we are recording this program. I will re be sending out the link to the presentation, uh, to this, the link to the recording of this presentation, hopefully later today, but it might be later, it might be tomorrow. It just depends on how long it takes to upload. Um, we do have a lot more art talks scheduled for this, uh, this year so far. So if you're interested in those, check out our website and send me an email at slayland at townofsanandsemo.org to register for any of the art talks. Um, they're all diff uh, I ask for everybody to send me individual emails for each one because I create new lists, but um, we'll just figure something out. But feel free to email me any program questions you have. Um, a lot of wonderful presentation April, and that how much they enjoyed this. So thank you. I enjoyed it too. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, nobody has any questions. I will end <laughs> our meeting today, and I hope you all stay safe and healthy right now in these cold and winter months. Um, stay on the lookout for emails from the San Anselmo Library for all of our upcoming um, activities and programs that we have going on. Thank you, and thank you, April, so much for doing this. this okay, was, thank yeah, you. Yay, oh, thank happy. you, Sarah, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. All right, bye, everybody. Hope to see you soon, virtually, and stay safe and healthy. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.